asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. What more can you say about Norman Finkelstein that maybe hasn't already been said? He's um, obviously a very well-known political scientist, and activist and author. He's written multiple books, not always about Gaza and Palestine and Israel. He's most famous, I suppose, for his pretty outstanding book, The Holocaust Industry. And I don't know if you've ever read The Holocaust Industry. It's one of those books, I think, if you ever want to really begin to understand Israel, and the birth of Israel, and then the conduct of Israel in international politics. You really need to have a look at that book. It was published, I think, around about 99 or 2000, I think. Can't be any later. 2000, I would say. And Norman basically argues that the Holocaust has been exploited and used as an ideological weapon. Basically, to create a situation where Israel, which has a, and has always had a deplorable human rights record, could basically portray itself as a victim state. And not only that, but that people would be either reluctant to criticise Israel or they would be terrified to criticise Israel. That's the central theme of the Holocaust industry. It's an amazing book. It landed like a £2,000 bomb or an atomic bomb when it was published. It was um, incredible. Um, amazing man. Um, he's got a new book out and I gave him a shout last week um, to uh, to get the book, first of all, and to chat with him about it. It's called Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom. And it deals a lot with the goings-on or the events of the last 10 years in Palestine and occupied Palestine and Gaza. It's uh, a book that pulls no punches whatsoever. You wouldn't expect anything that Finkelstein would write to pull any punches. Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom. And I caught up with him today to uh, to speak about that book and one or two other things as well. Norman Finkelstein, here's how that conversation went. Uh, you don't want to miss this. Norman, congratulations on the book and on the fantastic reviews that you've received. I've been watching it very closely and I'm going to ask you a question that's going to bore you sadly because I'm sure you've been asked it time and again in the last couple of weeks but the book is very timely in light of recent events in Palestine in Gaza. It's very timely, isn't it? Well, it's timely but I don't think the mainstream media is convinced since contrary to what you just said I've not received a single mainstream media review or even request to comment on what's happening to Gaza. Nothing, Norman. Nothing from the British media or the media I, back home. And believe me, my publisher, uh, University of California Press, they have a very sophisticated publicity operation. So when I say no interest, interest it's not for a lack of trying. What has happened, before we talk about the book, I remember your famous interviews with the BBC and you thundering away at very hostile presenters, holding your own and putting the case forward. Hard talk comes to mind. What's happened, Norman? What's happened to the media that robust, de robust debate is a thing of the past? Oh, I think um, most of them have been cowed by... Israel and its supporters. Uh, the current crucifixion of Jeremy Corbyn is a another um, is another uh, warning to not mess with Israel. I was reading yesterday that Jeremy Corbyn's personal ratings have taken a nosedive. I guess it's 19 points in the last several months. And that's largely because of Russiagate in the first place, but secondly, the new hysteria that's been cupped up by um, Israel's supporters. 
uh, alleging falsely uh, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party and among Corbyn's Confederates. So nobody wants to be on the receiving end of this methodical, systematic, mudslinging, smearing, slurring campaigns orchestrated by the Israel lobby. Uh, so it's not surprising that they're now striving so much for what they call balance that any credible case for the Palestinians has to be silenced. Seeing as you brought Corbyn up, and I want to ask you this question and then we'll talk about the book. Seeing as you brought him up, have you been a bit disappointed by his response to these fairly baseless allegations that anti-Semitism is endemic in UK politics, but particularly in leftist UK politics? Norman, I'm, I'm an old hack. I've been covering politics for a long time. I remember a time when Corbyn and John McDonnell and others would have put up more of a fight against this sort of thing. Have you been in any way disappointed by the way they've dealt with it? Um, to tell you the truth, not really, because we have to keep the eyes on the prize. And the prize is they are trying to, um, they're trying to destroy Corbyn because of his in, uh, significantly because of his opinions on the Palestinians. And the statement he issued uh, yesterday or two days ago in support of the Gaza uh, nonviolent mass resistance was really a strong, powerful, compelling, uh, her, uh, courageous statement. And so I don't really care so much if he's not coming out swinging on the issue of this smear campaign about anti-Semites in the Labour Party. I doubt anyone cares apart from a handful of crazy Jews uh, and paid agents of Israel. I doubt anybody cares, you know. Um, so the last poll showed that the Labour Party was up by two points and the Conservatives were down by one point. So it doesn't seem that these smears have had their effect. Yes, they've had an effect on his personal standing. But then again, we have to see the big picture. And the big picture is we want Labour to win under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. Uh, so I, I'm, um, I'm pretty optimistic and I'm satisfied. I was worried that he would capitulate or retreat on the question of Palestine. But the last statement of his makes um, crystal clear that he will not retreat. That's a nice bit of balance for this programme because I'm not as optimistic as you, but it's nice to hear the other side of it. Norman Finkelstein is our guest. It's a, a genuine pleasure to be speaking with Norman again. Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom, is Norman's new book, his latest book. I recommend you pick up a copy of it at the earliest opportunity. Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom. Norman, how much of what is in the book, which I've begun reading, by the way, is informed by... That puts, that puts you ahead of all the reviewers. Of all the reviewers, you see. I, but when we spoke about you coming on, of course, I picked up a copy. I, I, I am horrified that. BBC stations around the country, in light of everything that's going on, have not been in touch to get you on to speak to provide some balance to the um, endless pro-Israeli stories we get these days. But um, I'm not wholly surprised. You, of course, wrote... The last time we spoke was when we were... I think we talked about what Gandhi says about non-violence, resistance and courage, which, of course, is a terrific book. Um, it was shortly after that. But before that, you wrote a book about Judge Richard Goldstone. Goldstone recants. Richard Goldstone renews Israel's license to kill. And this was a terrific um, examination of what Goldstone did after Operation Cast Lead when there was an enormous criticism of what Israel was doing, but then a kind of a recanting of sorts. 
How much of what you've looked at in this book, Norman, over the last 10 years has been informed by Goldstone and how much of the media attitude to Gaza has changed or or, or is informed now because of what happened to Judge uh, Goldstone? Well, the last quarter of the book deals with Operation Protective Edge in July, August 2014, and um, the betrayal by human rights organizations of um, Palestine, of Gaza. And I ascribe the silence and the cowardice of the human rights organizations to their fear of the of being themselves goldstoned, because in my opinion, the most plausible explanation for why Goldstone recanted his report was that he was blackmailed, uh, namely that um, they dug up dirt on him, put the gun to his head, and uh, he capitulated. So in that, uh, <clears throat> and that, because um, you you've actually suggested Norman that Goldstone's mea culpa article in the Washington Post may have been written by a third party. Now, in the interest of fairness and balance, Goldstone is not here to speak for himself, and he might say this is nonsense. But you do believe that his the, the whole recanting in in and of itself was written by somebody else. Um, Well, it's not a question of whether it was written by someone else, Uh, even though somebody who knows Goldstone very well in a professional and personal capacity conveyed to me emphatically that he did not believe Goldstone wrote that recantation. It was just not his prose. It was not his style. Uh, But leaving that aside, Uh, The bottom line is uh, what he wrote in that uh, so-called recantation was palpably not true. And then the question is, if it's not true, then why did he do it? (laughs) I think it's because he was blackmailed. The gun metaphorically was put to his head, as you suggested. Norman, can I put a little defence for human rights organisations? Just... um, Let me put one defence to you. I've Mm -hmm. spoken with people over the years, never in the manner... I mean, you, you, for many years, until 2008, of course, you've been to Palestine yourself. I've never been there. But I have spoken to human rights workers from various groups, Human Rights Watch and others. And they've said, you know, we reported for many years on really atrocious things, unspeakably evil things, women in childbirth falling ill at checkpoints, babies being born at checkpoints and then dying. This is not propaganda. It's absolutely true. And you know what human rights workers have told me, Norman? They've said, where did that get us? When we reported on that stuff and tried to get it out there and onto mainstream media, it didn't get us anywhere. Is that is that a fair defence of... I mean, you, you are... And I can I think I can understand why you're so scurrilous when talking about the behaviour of these organisations. But don't they have a point when they say, we've tried for years, but it's not gotten us anywhere? Um, well, actually, they have a stronger point than that, because the Palestinian, the so-called Palestinian Authority has, throughout the Israeli massacres in Gaza, supported Israel, and it was the Palestinian Authority which effectively killed the Goldstone Report as it was passed from hand to hand in the UN bureaucracy. So I can understand the chagrin and the uh, resentment of the human rights workers and organizations when their findings have been buried, not just by Israel, but by the touted representatives of the Palestinians themselves. You're right. That's a fair answer. It's a fair point. I mean, I'll be speaking at some stage in the very near future to 
human rights activists, and I will put your points to them um, in the interest again of balance. The book is, it's it's a must read the book. You talk about the possibility that by 2020, Gaza will be not virtually, but practically uninhabitable, Norman, as a result of cast lead and protective edge. What's going to happen to those people there? Well, unfortunately, as time passed, <clears throat> when that first report was issued in 2012, the, t- the title was put in, not in the declarative, but the interrogative, will Gaza be unlivable in 2020? As time elapsed, they began to move up the um, point of no return. Uh, and they were saying, 2020 is a little optimistic. And right now, as we speak, in critical, by critical indices, Gaza has become unlivable. So 97% of the water in Gaza is unfit for human consumption. And literally each day when children take drink water from the tap, they're being uh, poisoned. And so it's a fair statement that the Israeli blockade of Gaza is poisoning one million children uh, in Gaza. You know, when I speak about Israel, and we talk a lot about it on this program, I suppose it's only really the independent media that talks about Palestine and the the plight of men, women and children in Gaza. And when we hear stories about the conditions as you've outlined them there, sometimes we'll get cynical people. They will tweet the program live or they will email the program and they will say, you know, I love the Norman Finkelsteins of the world. I love the the Gilad Atzmans of the world and we, we love Shlomo Zand. We love all these people. But then they will say, but the Arabs themselves the Palestinians, Arab neighbours, don't care about what happens to Gaza. Now, Norman, you've been listening to this for most of your adult life. It comes up all the time. Is there any truth in that, Norman? Are are Palestinians condemned by the fact that their their neighbouring Arabs in Arab countries just don't care about them? No, I don't agree. God helps those who help themselves. The Palestinians have to find the, find the um, inner strength, find the moral wherewithal to proceed on their own. And they will be able, in my opinion, to find the support. Their, their, their unjust suffering will resonate in the international community. They don't need the emirs and the pashas and the crooks and the murderers and the thugs and the parasites in the Arab world who have always, always betrayed them, used them, exploited them, never given a darn for them. And I say good riddance. Let's move on and uh, see what happens. I want to talk, I'm, yeah. I'm confident. You're they confident. Really, the, the Saudis gave them money, bribed them to shut up. Now the bribes have ceased. They'll speak their minds. And I think that international public opinion, if they do things right, will rally behind them. We'll talk in a minute about Ahed Tamimi, and we'll talk about Gandhi, because I mentioned already you wrote a terrific book about Gandhi. Norman Finkelstein is our guest. We've got Norman for another 10, 12 minutes. I'm thrilled that he's back on the programme. Check out his latest read. It's more than a read. It's essential reading. Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom. You can get it at all good online retailers. Pick up a copy of it. A, because it's, as I said, essential. But B, if we don't continue to support writers and researchers like Norman, we're in serious trouble. And that's a fact. Um... Do you believe in evil, Norman? When you, you see these things happening 
in Gaza as they are. We talked about women dying at checkpoints in childbirth. And I know you're a scientist. I know you're a man of, of academia. I know you're a pragmatist. I've been speaking to you many times over the years. I don't know you personally, but I've come to know a little bit about you. Do you believe in evil though, Norman? These are purely evil things that are happening there and they are being carried out by by human beings, by people with families of their own and children of their own. Do you believe in evil? Um, look, how could I not believe in evil? I've been unemployed for 11 years. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that answers that. So I've seen the face of evil, um, but I also believed in goodness. I've seen a lot of goodness in this world. I've been blessed to meet the most inspiring, dignified, really wonderful people humanity has to offer. So I don't, I don't, um, I don't fret or despair of evil. Um, there's evil in this world, though I happen to think for whatever it's worth, it's concentrated in a handful of people who have uh, uh, a monopoly over power and wealth. My own experience in life, meeting the grocer, the mail carrier, the um, the person at the checkout counter. Uh, my, my my experience has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, of course, uh, when I was in academia, my perceptions were colored by having to um, encounter my colleagues in academia, and that can dampen uh, even Mother Teresa's belief in humanity. Right, fair enough. And once, once you get out of academia and you're among normal people, it's a pretty good place. That's a good answer to that. Back in 2008, around about the first time I spoke with you, I think, you were banned from entering Israel for 10 years. Well, 10 years mm. has passed. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you go back to, to Gaza, Norman? Do you plan to, to try and, and, and make that happen? How do you feel about that 10 years later? Well, I couldn't get into Gaza, even if I got into Israel. Uh, so... Uh, Gaza is a separate story. Yeah. I, um, I, um, I, I think I will get into Gaza eventually because God's uh, four greatest inventions were fire, the wheel, cut and paste. <laughs> I should say five greatest inventions. <laughs> Fire the wheel, cut and paste, uh, Stormy Daniel's breasts. <laughs> you do have too much time on your hands. <laughs> and, and, and a password with a $500 bill in it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, there's no comeback to that. How do I, how do I come back to that? There's, there's never a comeback to me. No, there isn't, no. It's just a, a go away and sulk. If somebody said to me this morning, <laughs> and speaking to friends of mine and people who work around this radio program, I said I was excited to be speaking to my old pal, Norm Finkelstein, today. If somebody <laughs> said if somebody said he'd referenced Stormy Daniels, I would have lost a sizable <laughs> bet, but you I did. Never I never referenced her. <laughs> no, you didn't. Fair enough. <laughs> the breasts. Um, before we talk about... You know, go I ahead. don't watch television. I don't own a TV. But um, I was the other day in a TV studio and they had Anderson Cooper uh, interviewing Stormy Daniels and they had a picture of her behind him and he was completely overshadowed by her breasts. He was dwarfed. <laughs> yes, she's, um, do you know, you, you, of course, know that I'm from God's country, Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. And um, 
in, in Ireland we would say she's um, she's a big girl, God bless her. That's what we would say. I want to ask you about... Um, I was going to ask you about Trump's administration and how it's influenced by Israel. There's no point in wasting your time with a question like that. So let's talk about what the Palestinians will do. Please God what they will do. You said you're optimistic. You talked... I, I, I've seen some of the interviews you've given and I know they haven't been as numerous as, as you would like and, and as you deserve, but I've seen one or two interviews. You talk about Ahed Tamimi and her standing there, you know, slapping the face of brutality and of oppression. And you've suggested, I think you've suggested, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Norman, wouldn't it be a great thing if Palestinian women decided that there would be a day, not of rage, but a day of... I don't know, standing up to it, and if they all found a, a soldier to slap in the face. But this then kind of segues into Gandhi. Massive non-violent resistance. Could it work there, Norman, do you think? Well, as it happens, I don't want to be claim I don't want to be the one to claim uh credit for anything, but if you read my book, um I've been saying for years now that the only thing that can work in Gaza is mass nonviolent resistance. Yeah. And in particular, they have to march on the checkpoints on mass. And um, well, I'll read it to you <clears throat> from my book. Um, I say, they're referring now to Operation, let's see, Operation Pillar of Defense in 2012. I said there was precious little evidence that Palestinians could ever muster sufficient military might to compel a full Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories. But Gaza's steadfastness until the final hour of Operation Pillar of Defense did demonstrate the indomitable will of the people of Palestine. If this potential force could be harnessed in a campaign of mass civil resistance and supporters of Palestinian rights abroad in tandem mobilized international public opinion then Israel might be coerced into ending the occupation while fewer Palestinian lives would be lost than in futile armed struggle. And at the end of the book, in the conclusion, I reiterate my belief, which I've held to for the past at least seven or eight years, that the only way to uh, end the illegal, inhuman, immoral blockade of Gaza is for mass civil resistance, um, mass civil resistance. So if you allow me again, I'll read from the conclusion of a book, from the book, a strategy of mass nonviolent resistance might yet turn the tide. Gaza's richest resources are its people, the truth, and public opinion. Time and again, and come what may, the people of Gaza have evinced a granite will, born of what UNRWA spokesman Chris Gunnis calls a sheer indomitable dignity, not to be held in bondage. Protective Edge battered this will, but it appears did not yet shatter it. Truth is on the side of Gaza. If this book rises to a crescendo of anger and indignation, it's because the endless lies about Gaza by those who know better cause one's innards to rise. Gandhi called his doctrine of nonviolence satyagraha, which he translated as hold on to the truth. 
If the people of Gaza in their multitudes hold on to the truth, it's possible, which is not to say probable, let alone certain, just possible, and not without immense personal sacrifice, up to and including death, that Israel can be forced to lift the suffocating blockade. Well, it goes on in that vein, but you can see that already a long time ago, I was uh, speaking on this possibility uh, of a um, mass nonviolent civil resistance, which can corner Israel and um, achieve at least as a start the concrete victory of ending the blockade. And I can endorse that because it's a, it's a question I've asked you in the past. I've asked about solutions. And to be fair to you, you're absolutely right. You have spoken of it in the past. So I'll ask you one final question then, Norman, and it's been, um, it's been great to catch up with you. Norman's book is Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom, available at all good online retailers. Get it, folks, you know, get it. We've got to, first of all, it's well worth your while to get it. But second of all, we got to support researchers. I've made this point already. And um, political uh, commentators and scientists like Norman challenging the status quo, challenging the establishment narrative. Norman, I don't know if you've ever been asked this before. Maybe you have. I'll, I'll take a punt. I'll chance my arm. Why does the plight of the people of Palestine, why does it mean so much to you personally? Well, it does. And there's a, a very big misunderstanding on that point. Um, Up until fairly late in the game, until 1982, I was born in 1953. So until uh, I was 29 years old, was it 29, 53, 63, 73, (coughs) one second, uh, 53, yeah, 29 years old. Gaza, Palestine wasn't even on my radar. I was uh, involved in, as a youth, in my teens, the war in Vietnam, civil rights. I was involved in the wars in Central America. I was involved in the United Farm Workers, the Mexican Americans who were trying to unionize. I was involved in many causes and struggles. I became involved in uh, Palestine in 1982 when Israel invaded Lebanon. Uh, So it's not as if I have this E-Day fix or obsession with Palestine, it's that I'm not a quitter. Yeah. People come and go, people blow with the wind, people like fashions, people like, um, they like to pose yeah. for media. That's just not what I'm about. And I'm not going to abandon the people at any point because it's no longer fashionable or because it's no longer fun or because it's no longer uh, get, garnering uh, headlines. I'll stick to it until they achieve at least some of the goals that they set out to achieve. And when they've done that, then I'll feel free to move on. But the basic moral principle is very simple. If they can't move on, if they don't have the luxury of moving on, then I don't have the right to move on. That's a brilliant way to conclude, Norman. You make a very good point, I think, about... You make a very good point about people who in the past might have used Palestinians as their props, activists in certain parts of the world. I don't know if that's the point you were making, but that's what I take from it. And I... And, 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 yeah. People are fickle. Yeah. Very few people have the... Um, have the capacity for persistence when the ego is not being gratified or the bank account is not being filled. So that's just a general comment on human nature. Uh, So I'm not going to fault anyone. Um, I'm just saying that's not what I'm about. And I'm not going anywhere until the Palestinians can go somewhere. 
fi- absolute, this is what we call the ABF, the absolutely bloody final question. I've got to just touch on that just for one second because I, I asked the question, why does it mean so much to you? And you said you didn't. And you quite rightly talked about how the Lebanon um, war piqued your interest in what was happening. But at the same time, Norman, I've been speaking to you since 2008, 2009. Your admiration, as you've expressed today, for the dignity and the humility uh, and the humanity of people in Gaza shines through. And I don't want to make this all kind of mushy and soppy, but they have a real special place in your heart. They must do. Um, I've not been there in a very long time. And I'm the kind of person who I need to refresh my moral batteries by human contact. Yeah. So it's hard for me to be moved and touched in the absence of that connection without in the fail in the inability to recharge my moral batteries with that connection. So it's not so much being moved and touched by um, the people of Gaza as it is being revolted, disgusted, and indignant at all the lies and the cowardice of people who, as I quote you from my book, who know better this constant reiteration day in and day out, hour in and hour out, of what they call Israel's border fence. Border fence? Baruch Kimmerling, the distinguished Hebrew University sociologist, already back in 2003, referred to Gaza as the biggest concentration camp in the world ever. Haaretz, Israel's uh, most respected newspaper, refers to the Gaza ghetto. Um, Even your conservative prime minister, David Cameron, refers to Gaza as an open air prison. But then yesterday along comes the International Committee of the Red Cross, and it issues a statement referring to Israel's legitimate security concerns. What is the legitimate security concern? To keep a concentration camp hermetically sealed? To keep a ghetto hermetically sealed? To keep an open air prison with one million children hermetically sealed? They have a legitimate security concern that the people of Gaza should not be able to break out of a concentration camp where they're being poisoned every day. It's disgusting. I wish the ICRC and all those other organizations burn in hell for the things they say, their wretched cowardice. Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom, out now by Norman Finkelstein, who you've been listening to with um, us this afternoon. Norman, thanks for giving us your time when um, there's a lot of demands on your time. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Congratulations on the book and thanks for writing it. Thank you. You're welcome.